Hello everyone and welcome to the Geek Narrator podcast. I am your host Tevil Yapte and I am back with another episode. Today we are going to talk about a streaming database called Rising Wave and to discuss about the technical architecture, how Rising Wave works and why do we need a database like Rising Wave. We have founder and CEO of Rising Wave Labs, uh, Ying Jun. Welcome to the show. Thanks a lot for joining us today. And uh, let's start with a little bit of introduction about yourself and about Rising Wave Labs. Sure. Thanks for having me here. Hello, everyone. My name is Yingjun Wu, and I'm the founder of Rising Wave Labs. So Rising Wave Labs is a three-year-old company, and what we focus on is to build the next generation database for stream processing. So basically, if you have a streaming data, you definitely want to process it, right? And Rising Wave is the focus on how you can simplify your streaming architecture and simplify your data stack to process streaming data. So I started this company, as I mentioned, three years ago, and the period of that I was in AWS Redshift, so the data warehouse, right? So if you use AWS, you probably know what the Redshift is. And before that, I was in IBM Research Armadon. Actually, IBM Research Armadon was a pretty fun place because for the, essentially the database was invented in IBM Research Armadon. And yeah, that's a pretty cool uh, place. Definitely, you probably definitely want to check out. And I obtained my PhD from National University of Singapore, working on stream processing and database systems. So essentially, I have already had working on these domains for streaming database and stream processing and database systems for over 10 years. That's it. That's awesome. And to understand a bit more, of course, we are going to dive deep into how Rising Wave works. But let's define some of the terminologies that we are going to use. And people might be aware of streaming platforms, streaming engines, streaming database. But let's start defining what is a streaming database and what is Rising Wave. Yeah, cool. So definitely that's a great question because when I talk to people about, about to a streaming database, people, if they do not really understand what the stream processing is, they will think about, okay, whether it's a database system, whether it's MySQL, Postgres, or probably whether it's like real-time Postgres or probably real-time database, right? So I think the, the easiest way to explain what, what streaming database is the, a database to, that can help you to process streaming data. That's it. So basically you can process streaming data in a database way or in the other way, you can think of like, okay, you can use a database system to process streaming data. And that's what a streaming database is. So for Rising Wave, it's, it is a streaming database. Basically, it can help you to store data, but more importantly, it helps you to process the streaming data. And that's what Rising Wave is. Okay. Okay. So basically, if I have to use a streaming database like Rising Wave, of course, it's a database, so it will help me to store my data, yeah. uh, but it will also enable me to do stream processing on the data quite easily. Now, how... It works. We are going to dive deep into that. But let's talk a little bit about the use case that we are talking about, right? Let's say, for example, I have a e-commerce application where orders are created. And let's say I use a streaming database like Rising Wave. So orders are created. My orders are stored on the database. And that's the like a traditional way we look at databases, right? Like Postgres, for example. I have a Postgres installation. I store all the orders. And when I want to uh, stream the data, let's say I use a solution like a CDC and then stream it through Kafka or take it uh, somewhere, right? Where does Rising Wave fit into this architecture and how does that change? Okay, so the first thing I would like to mention is that okay, Rising Wave is not, or a streaming database is not going to replace your tra transactional database like Postgres or MySQL. It's not okay dropping replacements. You don't need to have Postgres or you don't need to have MySQL. You still need to have MySQL and you still need to have Postgres to process transactional workload. And you still need to have, let's say, a Kafka to help you to ingest the streaming data, let's say the click streams, right? Or probably the yeah. impression stream from the website, right? Definitely you still need to have a Kafka. But the thing here that okay, these kind of systems like transitional database and the messaging queues, Kafka, help you to store data. But at the end of the day, you probably really want to have a system that can help you to analyze the data, analyze the streaming data, right? 
So people will mention that probably you can just use a data warehouse like Redshift or Snowflake, right? But the thing here that okay, this kind of data warehouse is for processing, let's say, historic data. You can probably store a large amount of data, click streams, impression streams, or transaction transactional data in into their uh, those data warehouses in batches, right? Every single day, you dump into data yeah. warehouses and process there, process the data there, or probably do analytic do analytics there. But today, many people really want to process data on the fly. Basically, if I have some new data, I just want to process it and I just want to do analytics over it. And I just want to extract the raw time insight so that I can do some actions, right? And that's Rising Wave, right? Basically, Rising Wave can help you to continually consume streaming data and then process the streaming data on the fly. That's a key thing, right? Rising Wave. People may also ask about okay, what, why, why we need to process streaming data and what what's the use case, right? I can give you yeah. a few why I need to make real time decision, right? And think about fraud detection. I think where it's a definitely a great application, right? And another great application is like and more them okay by my website and I want to check okay what what oh which app works best. Then I probably need to process it on the fly. I probably don't really want to say, okay, I can process the data tonight. And then I review, okay, what apps work better. And, and, but to a writing list, all the streaming database doesn't really just, okay, fit into, let's say the, um, the, uh, I mean, can be only used by those who are big techs. Think about to manufacturing companies, right? Well, people may, may think that, okay, such kind of manufacturing, probably their data stack is pretty old. But the thing here that okay, this kind of manufacturing company or probably energy companies also need to process a large amount of streaming data. For example, they have a factory and in the factory, we probably we need to monitor the, the, the pipeline, right? So the, the manufacturing pipeline. And essentially in the old days, what, what this, uh, this kind of manufacturing companies or factories do is that okay, they actually make phone calls every six hours and talk to their factory manager saying, okay, what's everything going on? So is there anything wrong happen? But nowadays, so they have the streaming data, like, oh, streaming processing system. Then what the things can, they can do is that okay, they can just, there's in just the data from those factories, you know, from the databases stored in those factories. And then they can just uh, sit in the office and watch, okay, what's happening there and whether there is any anomalies occurred. So that's yep. how Reading Wave case why and that's a great example <clears throat> and i've in production i have worked with some streaming solutions and as you mentioned rising wave or any other streaming database cannot replace your transactional store which is like a postgres or a mysql database you still need a, a kafka to take your events and publish it somewhere else but it helps you reduce or helps you solve your streaming use cases in an easier fashion what I have done in production is typically, let's say your data is in Kafka. So we have, let's say, Kafka streaming libraries where we can do stream processing and also do some analytics on top of it or dump it into an analytics data store and then run queries on that store, something like Apache Pino. Or people also have Flink jobs or Spark streaming jobs where, you know, they do some stream processing, do some analytics and serve queries on near real time. How does that where I have a streaming engine, like I have streaming pipelines, I have jobs. How does that compare to having a streaming database? Okay, so when you talk about the streaming jobs, I assume that you're talking about, let's say, systems. Well, you're using systems like Spark Streaming or probably Flink or probably yeah. Yeah, some others like SAM, or yeah. uh, other streaming systems. So I think the biggest difference is how we think about it, how we can process streaming data. So if you live in the big data world, then the thing here that okay, you probably need to process the data you in some low le lower level APIs like Java, right? Like Scala, or probably in modern days, people use Python, right? If you use Spark, yeah. you probably need to use Java, Scala, and Python, right? So, but, but definitely I know that okay, I mean, these kind of systems have already introduced a SQL layer, but yes, but at the end of the day, many people still use the Java, Python, or Scala APIs, but yeah. streaming database value to process streaming data in specifically a database way. 
That is, you don't actually have access to lower level APIs. You just have access to the SQL layer. And, but then do you have a UDF? Okay, you can use well, user default function. You can write the functions in Python. You can use uh, write functions in even in C++, but you don't need to have lower level controls. You don't have access to a, a lower level APIs, or probably you don't have access to, let's say, some detailed, detailed configurations, right? You don't have access to that. So basically, if, if you do not really have access to these kind of lower level APIs, you just need to think about okay, how you write SQL and how you want to express your logic in SQL. That's mm -hmm. a key. And actually another key difference here, that key, if you write, let's say, if you write an application using uh, Spark or using Flink, mm -hmm. then you actually need to think about, okay, where you want to store data, mm -hmm. right? Because Spark doesn't really help you to store data. And Flink yeah. also don't really help you to store data. You actually need yeah. to find a storage engine, right? Probably That's data right. lake or probably a database, right? But writing web is a database and it's just streaming database. So essentially you can just store data there in writing web. That's it. Okay. That, that makes sense. And since I have used that kind of a pipeline where we were using Flink and Kafka streams and also a little bit of Spark, we used S3 as our storage. Uh, some uh, legacy use cases also had HDFS and whatnot. So it was like quite a complicated architecture. But I would say it it needs that kind of level of experience to support that or maintain that kind of a pipeline. Hearing from you about streaming databases that all that complexity is abstracted away from the user. They just care about what kind of analytics they want to support. They have the SQL interface, which is quite a standard when people talk to databases. So I think a use case wise, it all makes sense. I want to ask you, let's say, is, is it only for the real time aspect of the streaming or it's also analytics on, let's say, historical data, which is stored in my database? So that's a pretty good question. If you talk about the, let's say Spark, right? Well, Spark can actually have the Spark streaming and the Spark. The yeah. batch processing. So that's right. what you said. The okay, case basically unified batch and streaming, right? And you can use the batch engine to process the stream, store the data, and use the streaming engine to process the real time data. And nowadays, though, many people think that okay, Flink also is is a streaming engine, right? But they are evolve also evolving into let's say unified batch and streaming. So basically, they also spend a lot of efforts improving their batch engine, right? That's what Flinks look like and all, uh, how it will evolve. But writing wave as a database, well, a database can store data and by default, it can process, it can store a lot of historic data, right? Large amount of data, historic data. And by default, it will have the capability to process historic data. So mm. in a database world, processing historic data is just by default. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, but the writing wave is more like, okay, so, so what the writing wave wants to deliver is that okay, you can process stream, you can store your historic data there, but you, at the same time, you can also continuously process your streaming data so that okay, you can achieve the best of both worlds. Yeah, that's okay. how writing wave works. Makes sense, makes sense. So I think that makes it pretty clear what the use case is, what problem does a streaming database like Rising Wave solves for the user. How would my architecture change. So let's say going back to the e-commerce example, right? Let's say I have a Postgres database, I have Kafka, I use some other databases as well. But let's say I want to take data into rising wave to actually be able to run real-time analytics using SQL. So how would my architecture change when I try to integrate with rising wave? Well, so I think what is just like uh, dropping. So for example, you have a Postgres to support your website. And also have your, have already had your Kafka to support your, let's say, to consume your streaming data, click streams, impression streams. Yeah. Yeah. And the only thing you need to, if you want to use writing wave, you just put a writing wave there and ask the writing wave to connect to your Postgres and connect to your Kafka. Yeah. Right. Just connect to those systems and then it will process the data. So that's it. You don't need to think about, okay, whether I need to have uh, a database or probably yeah. you don't need to think about, okay, how I can connect different pipelines. So I think there's a, yeah. So if you have experience working with, let's say Spark or probably working with Flink, 
then you will know that okay, these kind of systems can also connect to you, can also connect to uh, Postgres and can also connect to uh, Kafka. But the yeah. thing here that okay, if you want to use such kind of systems, you actually need to think about, okay, I have a streaming job and I, I want to create another job to consume the streaming jobs results and then do some processing, do some additional processing, yes. right? And then how you can connect these two streaming jobs, you probably need to, you actually have to have a Kafka. Or probably you actually have to have a, let's say, a three as yeah. an intermediate layer to connect these two systems. And at the end of the day, you process data, you also need to think about, okay, how, where I can store those data, probably in DynamoDB or probably in MongoDB or probably in Postgres or probably in MySQL. You also need to think about like how I can deliver the results into those systems, right? So the pipeline, in cloud pipeline, if you use Spark or you, if you use Flink, it will become that okay, you will have Flink, Kafka database, all these components mingled together, and uh, they, yeah, you need to figure out how to manage the, all these systems. But the right way we actually help you to simplify the architecture. Basically, you only you the only thing you need is a streaming database. Why? The first thing here that okay, it has the streaming processing engine. And second thing here that okay, it itself is a database system. And third thing here that okay, in this, how you can express your streaming processing logic in Rising Wave, that is through materialized views, right? In a database system, you actually can create materialized views on top of another materialized view, which is called cascading materialized view or stack materialized views in some context. So essentially, you don't need to think about okay, how I can use a Kafka to connect two different Flink jobs or probably two, two different Spark stream jobs. The only thing you need to do is that they create a material on top of another material you. That's it. So basically, Rising Wave is kind of the key the benefit. One of the key benefits of Rising Wave is to all streaming databases to help you to simplify your data stack. Absolutely. Yeah, it does, it does seem it is going to take away all the complexity that one needs to implement to build their own streaming engine as compared to using a streaming database like Rising Wave. <clears throat> so to end the loop there, so we have the data in Rising Wave now and in, in the traditional or, or stream processing world where we had this pipelines, Kafka or Flink, we would store some analytics result in some database and then support, for example, a REST API to expose that kind of analytics, which will be then queried by some UI just to show our dashboard. So this is a loop where we are ingesting data, some the pipelines are calculating some or doing some analytics, and then we expose that result over REST API. In rising wave or a streaming database, we have a SQL query running, right? Let's say calculating last what is happening in last five minutes or one hour. And how does that loop get, you know, how does the UI uh, dashboard gets connected? So when the SQL result is emitted, where does it go? How does that connect? Okay. Okay. That's a great question. So they actually introduced another topic, which is well, how people connect, visualize the result, essentially, right? Or get yeah. a result. So yeah. you have the SQL, right? And probably I cannot just, let's say, type in SQL command and see the results, right? Definitely you can do that, but yeah. it's kind of hacky. The good thing of writing with one of the great things I love in writing with is that okay, it's, uh, it's Postgres compatible, which means that okay, essentially it speaks in Postgres language, Postgres SQL language. And okay. it's also well compatible with Postgres, which means that, okay, as long as you have a system that can connect to Postgres, you can connect it to right away. So I can give you some examples. Okay. The BI tools like Metabase, like Superset, like Grafana, like some others, right? As long as these systems are very, obviously barely can connect to Postgres, as long as these systems can connect to writing wave, connect to Postgres, you can actually connect this system to writing wave. So in many cases, our users just use Grafana, um, Superset, or some other UI tools to visualize it. Exactly. And in terms of API, actually, we also see people, they probably really want to have GraphQL, right? Probably some other RESTful API, right? And I think, yeah, we, I think we have already delivered that. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. And that kind of completes the loop when we talk about the use case and how it will fit my architecture, right? Now, there are multiple things about Rising Wave that we can talk about. But for example, Rising Wave is a cloud native, SQL streaming database. Rising Wave is written in Rust. So we can also talk about that, but I know there is a great blog written by you 
which is quite popular. So I would uh, ask our viewers if you are interested, like why Rising Wave chose Rust as a language and how it helped. Uh, so I would add that link to the description. So please go and read that blog. It's pretty interesting. But what we want to talk about today is how Rising Wave works, right? So we want to talk about its architecture, some of the internal optimized or design decisions that we that Rising Wave has taken. So let's go through like in high level architecture. So when I look at Rising Wave, what am I looking at? Well, Red Wave is a database. That's the first thing, right? And yeah. the second thing here that key, what a kind of, what a database can do, basically two things. One is computation and the other one is storage. Yeah. And for the, if you use Postgres, you will know that case a single node database system, right? Postgres, MySQL, both are single node database system. So basically they put Postgres, they put a computation and storage in the same machine. That's it, right? And for writing web, it's a distributed system. So there are two ways to distribute the system, right? The first way is that you can probably do share nothing. Yeah, basically you partition the data into different pieces and then put this, put a, every single store, right? Partition the store into one machine. If you have three machines and just partition the data into three pieces and put those data into three machines, then do computations and these nodes can talk to each other. That's shell nothing architecture. But the rising waves architecture is like shell, uh, shell disk or shell storage. It's the shell mm -hmm. storage is S3. That's why it's cloud native. And uh, in the cloud, the storage of uh, persistent storage is essentially S3. So what do we do with that case? We put the storage in S3. And for local machines like EC2, it's, it only needs to cache data. Let's say regional data or probably hot data. You can cache the data there and you can get the best performance and you still do computation there. So one of the best, one of the biggest benefits of this architecture is that it essentially decouple your computation and the storage. Okay. Storage is in S3, while computation is in C2. So that you can get two things. First one is that with instant failure recovery. And second thing here, that's dynamic scaling. So we can talk about a, a, a failure recovery first. If you have three machines, let's say if you use shell nothing architecture and you have three machines, then what do we do if one machine crashes? You probably need to build another machine and ask that machine to reload your checkpoint from, yeah, from your, let's say, archive, right? Mm -hmm. Probably in S3. Reload the state into the new machine and then recover, right? So basically there is some recovery time, right? Because we'll, if the data is not reloaded into that machine, the system, the database will not function at all. You cannot send any query to a database system. That's a problem of a shell nothing architecture. But if you have a shell storage architecture or shell, then the thing changes. Basically, if one computation engine fails, no worries. You just put another machine and you can directly ask that machine to fetch the data, to fetch the state of financial storage from your S3. So that we, there's no downtime at all, right? Because well, all the state is already being in S3 and you can just load it. That's it. You can directly access it. That's it. Yeah. And similarly, dynamic scaling is also can, can be done in the same pattern because if we want to scale from one machine to three machines, we do not need to think about like how we can migrate the state into from one machine to the other three machines. Basically, the thing will happen is that okay, all these three machines can ask, uh, can directly access data in S3. So that simplifies things a lot and the users can achieve instant failure recovery and transparent dynamic scaling. Yeah, that's a great okay. benefit of this strategy. Yeah, Th that makes sense. And at a, at a high level, if I understand correctly, so you explain share nothing architecture, which is let's say used by Cassandra and some other popular databases. But what we have here is S3 is at the storage layer. So whatever data we store is in S3. And on top of that, you have compute nodes, for example, EC2. And those nodes are basically stateless. They just, of course, they cache data from S3 just to avoid a round trip. But they don't own or they are not leader or a primary node for any data or a block of data, right? So they always talk to S3, any node can host or serve a request for any type of data. 
it, it is not partitioned at all. So compute nodes are basically decoupled from how the storage works. They just know how to query the data and then you can add more nodes for your compute for dynamic scaling. You get, of course, fault tolerance because there's no single node that is a leader and then there's no consensus happening and all that. And then you also get durability of the S3, uh, which is quite durable, I guess, 11 nines, right? Yeah, so the high-level architecture looks good and we it's pretty clear what the benefits could be. But when I'm ingesting data, for example, I have a click stream, as we talked about, I have a transactional data from my Postgres. And these are two event streams coming in. Let's say data is in Kafka. I, I can connect my Kafka and I can connect my Postgres to Rising Wave. How does the data reaches Rising Wave and how it reaches ultimately S3, which is a storage um, layer? So let's say that can simplify things a little bit. But let's say that you have data in Kafka and now you connect Rising Wave into your Kafka. The thing will happen is that K Rising Wave will continuously consume data from Kafka. And then it will directly dump the data, uh, dump Kafka uh, into S3. So basically, so the, uh, in this way, the data is actually persisted. But people mm -hmm. will argue that if I do uh, directly ingest the data from Kafka and then consume, uh, continue to consume data from Kafka and directly dump into S3, then S3's latency can become a huge problem, right? For sure, that's true. So essentially yeah. we are not doing, we are not like, okay, every single time I consume data and directly uh, dump into S3, we still do a little bit batching. So basically micro batching, we will actually catch data in the local machine. And the once the data grows to a certain limit, we will persist it into S3. That's how it works. Got it. Let, let's take an example here, right? Let's say I'm tracking click stream for a customer. Let's say customer name, right? ABC, for example. So when the click stream from Kafka is ingested into Rising Wave, there can be multiple nodes that, that are taking care of the, the events, right? Because there's no one node which is assigned to this customer or something based on partition key or something like that, right? So any node can uh, patch the data coming for uh, any customer and then they patch the data and send it to S3. So uh, how does the, the batching work? So is it all in memory batching and then making one call to S3? Can you share that a little bit? Okay, okay. Let's first talk about what the, let's say we have three machines, right? But how these three machines react and how these three machines work. Essentially for these three machines, we still, let's say that we have three machines and the, all the, and the radio wave is connected to Kafka and we still actually shuffle the data into these three machines. Hmm. And it's not okay. We have a, a thousand tuples here, and I just this a thousand tuple to every single machine. It's not like that. It's okay. I still shuffle this a thousand tuples into three ports. In, okay, uh, into machine one, machine two, and machine three. The reason here we do this is straightforwardly because we want to do load balancing, and we don't really want to every single. We don't really want to have every single system need, uh, processing. Let's say these are some of tuples, right? Yeah. And then let's say that here one machine gets, let's say, 200 tuples. And the other one gets, let's say, 400. And the third one gets also get a 400, right? So basically what we're having is that okay, for every single machine, it will, uh, I don't know the threshold, but so let's say that where it consumed, let's say, 100 tuples. Once it hits 100, offering a certain fixed amount of size, I've got a yeah. size, uh, I've got a threshold. Once it hits a limit, the machine will dump a batch of tuples into S3. Mm. That's how it works. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And how does the fault tolerance work here? So for example, I'm streaming data, I'm batching uh, tuples in memory. And once I have, let's say hundred uh, tuples, I try to push them to S3, but let's say this fails. So how does that work with the fault tolerance mechanism? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So basically it relies on the upstream data, data system, for example, Kafka. So mm. basically in writing wave, it will track the progress. So-called progress where it's like offset in, in Kafka. Yes. Okay, how, where were it percent? Let's say that if a machine failed before consuming, before persisting data into S3, then it will actually retrieve the same, once the data, once the system recovered, 
it will ask the Kafka to send exactly the same batch, uh, same data from Kafka to writing wave. So people will wonder, okay, what if, oh, why we have such kind of design? This is literally a database design. In the database world, we have the famous so-called Red Hat Log. Every single database have the Red Hat Log. And how Red Hat Log works is, okay, it will basically do the many batching in, in, the, in, in the memory. And once we got enough data, then we shuffle, uh, when, then we flush data into S3 or pro into a disk. That's how database work. And writing wave is a database and it adopts exactly the same mechanism. That, that makes sense. <clears throat> and so basically this depends on a write at log and it won't commit That's right. to Kafka that the, these are the offsets I have consumed. And if something fails, it will try to reprocess from the previous offset. And of course there can be duplicates. If I understand correctly, because you might be able to push to S3, but the machine might not get the acknowledgement and it will consider that these, this data was not pushed. It will try to reprocess from Kafka. There might be duplicate entries in S3, right? So how does idempotency work here? If you put into S3 and the machine didn't really get the acknowledgement, so I didn't really know whether that will happen because we always assume that the S3 is reliable, right? Okay. If we can allocate acknowledgement from S3, then I think it's weird, but uh, definitely I, I, I believe that's that can happen. Let's say that S3 is, so actually in, in our case, we, we didn't really encounter any problem in S3, but sometimes S3 is slow because we make it the, let's say the yeah. S3's proposed limit. And it, it does happen that sometimes we feel that we find that S3 didn't really send back an acknowledgement after a certain period of time, right? So yeah. whatever we do, that like, KPFC okay, will try. Yeah, that's the thing. That makes sense. That makes sense. It, it's not only about S3. It might also be the network issue that S3 actually sent you an acknowledgement, but you didn't get it or something. But yeah, retry is the way to go. And once you retry, there can be duplicates and it will be handled differently. Uh, yeah. And, the, yeah. The thing here that in Reading Wave, we have the so-called, again, we have the so-called progress. Yeah. Or essentially it's called our epoch. We actually we'll track okay, whether the epoch has already just processed, uh, has already been processed or have never been processed. Yeah. So that okay, we can, we'll actually know, okay, whether we handle every single tuple exactly once. Mm, yeah. Makes sense. So I have, I have two questions here, right? Like, uh, when the data is pushed to S3, what data format do you use? How are the files stored on S3? We use our own, for, own formats for, and it's, it's actually raw store. It's raw store. We do not really use, use a column store. So the thing here that K, which means that K, we do not use something like a Pokoi. The thing here that K, why we do that, well, people may think that, hey, Pokoi is great, right? So you should definitely use open format. The thing here that K, luck, think about if you use the Postgres, you will not store data in Pokoi. And why? The reason here that K, for streaming data is actually optimized for two things. First one is streaming ingestion. And second one is that like random access. So streaming ingestion is easy to understand, right? Okay, you have the data continuously pro, uh, ingested from Kafka. And if you want to in ensure that you can consume all this data efficiently, then you should not use a column store, right? For, because for column store is slow in handling, in handling the streaming ingestion. That's one thing. And second thing here that okay, in a streaming database or in a streaming processing system, what happens most frequently is that okay, we do stream per, streaming jobs or so-called streaming operators, right? For example, if I want to join two different streams, the click stream and the impression stream, I want to join these two streams. So every single time a new tuple comes in from the click stream, what I will do is that okay, I will actually need to check okay, the, whether there's a match in the click stream, right? In yeah. the other stream, in the stream, right? And for such kind of check, it's essentially a random access. You cannot use, let's say, the column store because for the column store means that you actually have to scan the whole table, which is super slow. So that's why we use the row, the row store instead of column store. One interesting thing here that okay, I would like to mention here that okay, we are actually working with the iceberg community and we are actually, why we do that? The reason here is that, okay, as we discussed earlier, Streaming data, we, if we, once we just ingest a lot of streaming data, we actually need to have the historical data, right? So yesterday's data, or probably last year's data, it will become the historical data. 
for historic data, you cannot just store in raw store. You, you can definitely do that, well, but well, you cannot do any impression, if, sorry, compression, if you use raw store, right? So yeah. what we do is that we actually paradoxically dump the data, convert the data from raw store into column store and store in iceberg. Okay. Why are we storing iceberg? Because for all some other data lake formats, right? For I'm not sticking stick to, we're not sticking to just the iceberg. We can do who they are probably uh, data lake, right? We can yeah. definitely do that. So why we store in data lake format? Because we're also in this way, some other data engines like Presto, like uh, in, in AWS, is, AWS, these kind of systems can access the data stored in data, data lake format. Mm -hmm. That's why we do that. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. <clears throat> so basically you have your own format. It's not column store. Yeah. It's row, row based. And the reason, if I understand correctly, please correct me if I'm wrong, that the reason is you also want random access because you want to join different streams and doing that on a column store will be inefficient because you might want to join on different columns and all that. So that, that makes sense. And then since you, you have historical data, periodically you convert that row store data into column store and store it somewhere, for example, iceberg, to also support your historical queries. I think this all makes sense. Let's talk a little bit about, so you mentioned you are joining two streams, right? Let's say your click stream with, I don't know, order, transactional order, for example. So these are two streams. So do you join these streams at the ingestion time or is it actually happening when the, the queries are actually made? Okay. Okay. That's a great question. The, for in a streaming database. So in any database, you actually have two types of queries. The first one is called a pretty fun query. And the second one is called a hell query. Yeah. How we do pretty fun query or how we do a hell query. That's why that's simpler to understand. Okay. So the way we do a hell query is okay. We issue a query like select stuff from table or mm -hmm. select count stuff from table. That's once we issue the query, the database need to respond to my query. That's actually essentially the ad hoc query, right? Yeah. But in a database, in, a, in any database, you can actually define another type of query, which is pretty fun query. Like you can, what you, how you can do that? You can just write one single statement, which is pretty much rest view as, for example, I can write a statement called the pretty much rest view as select star from T or probably select com T, a com star from T. Once you define this view, essentially it will continuously process the data hmm. around this query for you. But in Postgres, it will, how it does is that okay, it will run this query at how quickly. When you want, when you issue a command called a refresh, it will help you to rerun this query. But in some systems like Snowflake, more advanced systems like Snowflake are probably Redshift. What we do, what this kind of system will do, that's where they will automatically refresh the matrix view for you. So writing wave is also can handle both predefined queries and ad hoc queries, but its focus is on predefined queries. So okay. basically, its key feature is matrix view. Basically, you create matrix view and regularly help you to continuously process, maintain this matrix view in a consistent manner, which means that's where data is always refreshed. It's always fresh and the data is always consistent. That's a key thing. So one, so back to your question, if we get two data streams coming in and I have already created, a, I have already created my stress U to join these two streams, then what will happen is that okay, once the data is consumed from the Kafka, so basically once the data hits into writing wave, then writing wave process the data before storing this data. So that's how things work. Yeah, that, that does make sense. And most of the times when I want to use a streaming database, I also know what kind of queries I want to support, right? Like I, I know what kind of uh, SQL queries I want to support and what kind of joins I want to make. So I think predefined queries make a lot of sense and would support 80% of my use case, for example. And 20%, of course, I want to run ad hoc reporting and for example, analytics. So in that case, for example, does rising wave make these joins on the query runtime because there's no materialized weave, right? So I'm talking about the ad hoc queries. So how does that work efficiently? So if you just want to run ad hoc query, let's say SNT in any condition, right? 
Yeah. If you ra- want to run this kind of statement, then the thing becomes that you just issue a hot query. And what Raisin Web does is that okay, just like a Postgres, it's probably just like a Redshift and it handles with a, a strong the join for you. Yeah, that's okay. it. The definitely we made a lot of while Rising Wave is let's say a streaming database, we actually made a lot of efforts in improving the IHL query performance. So what do we do is that we use the Vexrise engine. So basically the everything is Vexrise. That's how we can accelerate query processing. Okay. That makes sense. So yeah, okay. So we now have predefined queries and also ad hoc queries. Coming back to the the statelessness or the stateless behavior of the compute nodes, right? So my query can go to any node. Let's say I'm running a query for on a customer ID. I want to aggregate some click stream and I want to know what the customer has done in the last one hour, for example. And I want to, I, I have the materialized view and all that. Now, since my query can go to any node, how does the aggregation of data happen? So for example, I, I'm querying for last one hour and my query is handled by one node. How does it aggregate from based on the time that it requires. Let's say in S3, we store data until let's say 100 tuples are collected. And those 100 tuples were collected, let's say in last one second, depending on the pace. Now, but I'm querying for last one hour data. So will it end up querying a lot of S3 buckets or how does that work behind the scenes? So the thing here, the key, look, Raging Wave is she's S3 as a primary storage, which means that today it is actually maintaining S3. But it does really mean that okay, every time we fetch the data, we always need to touch S3. Yeah. The thing we did is that okay, we actually do a lot of caching in the local system, in the local EC2. So most of the time, if we want to do aggregation, we will only access a local cache unless there's a cache miss occur, right? Yeah. If there's a, a, a cache miss occur, then definitely you have to go to S3. And essentially that's also, also how Snowflake works, right? Snowflake also treats the only maintain the local cache in EC2. And if everything works well, and then most of the data will be cached in local, in local machine. And, but well, unfortunately, if there's cache miss, cache miss occur, then probably you have to go to S3. Basically we cache everything as much as possible. So basically, it totally depends on how much cash you, you allocated. If you allocated enough cash, let's say, imagine that we just allocated unlimited cash, then essentially the entire state in local machine, and you will yeah. never touch the S3 right. in, in the query runtime. But if you say that, okay, I don't really want to spend a lot of amount of money, right? So I probably only want to, let's say, set the cash to, let's say, 50% of my state size. Then what we're having is that okay, definitely we're used, we are using this uh, uh, algorithm called LRU, basically the, the caching policy. Yeah. LRU to help you to cache your hot data as well as the recent data so that okay, you will have, have a higher chance to only need to access the, lo- the local cache without touching S3. That's yeah. how things work. That makes sense. So it's a trade-off between cost that you want to have because you want to have more cache versus the latency of your queries because the less cache you have, the less cost you have, but the more latency for your queries because it has to query S3. So I think it's a trade-off. So as a user, can I decide on that trade-off or how, how is that made visible to the user? Yeah, you can decide. Whereas a user, you just can figure out okay, how many machines I want to use and definitely how many machines means that okay, how many CPUs as well as yeah. how, many, how much memory, right? But definitely you can think of well, what kind of machines I want to use. Let's say I, I probably only want to use a machine with just one single CPU, but one yeah. terabyte of memory. Definitely you can do that. I'm not sure whether it was really have such kind of instance type, but it all depends on the users to determine, okay, what kind of instant, instance they want to use. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. One, one thing I wanted to ask is whenever we have this stateless kind of architecture where there's no leader for any kind of data. How is that optimized for, let's say my query goes to node one and there's, it, it's all fresh. There's nothing in the cache. So it warms up the cache with that data. But the query two for the same customer can go to the node number two, right? So basically it can, let's say it's round robin. So we have three nodes. So every time it will go to different nodes and then 
the cash that node one and node two have already warmed up might not be used because the, the next query is going to node three, which is again fresh. So how this problem is solved typically in, in such an architecture? If you run a query and the data you request it is not in local machine, then unfortunately you will, you will have to load the data from S3. Yeah. But the good thing here that uh, once you load the data, you you reload the data from S3, basically this data, this newly reloaded data will be cached in S3, right? Well, uh, yeah. It will be inserted into like local cache. That's the basic strategy. And actually there was another interesting strategy I would like to share, which is to basically preloading. Uh, yeah, basically, so basically that's, there are some heuristic algorithms that can, that can help people to pre-populate the cache, depending on the query pattern. Mm -hmm. So in many cases, if you run a query, then typically the query has certain pattern, right? Let's say that we want to run a scan. We want to run the, run the table scan in, let's say in Redshift, right? Then Redshift will, uh, once Redshift accepts this query, it will know that, okay, look, this guy wants to access, once the, this guy wants to not just access the first block, first the, uh, data tuple, it actually needs to, this guy probably really wants to access the entire table then I can actually preload the table from S3 into my cache or from my disk into my cache so that okay, I will never need to access data from the, let's say the local disk or from the S3. Essentially, writing web does exactly the same thing. In stream processing, we actually have a pattern. Let's say that okay, we want to do joins and we want to do aggregations where they, at least kind of data, Cur this kind of curves actually have their specific pattern. And we just optimize the caching policy for such kind of query. Mm. And also another interesting thing I would like to share is that's where it's probably different, a little bit different cache, but uh, it's more about about caching the query pattern. So different queries have different patterns, right? For example, the aggregations totally depends on what kind of aggregation you want to have, let's say. Some aggregations really prefer, let's say, the uh, scanning, scans. But some aggregations prefer lookup, random access. Mm -hmm. In Rising, we actually optimize the data format to this query pattern. Once we receive the query for a different query, we actually know, okay, what kind, of query, what kind of query pattern it will look like. And then we will define the query pattern like that. Okay, Th that makes sense. Let's talk about the Postgres compatibility part because that is another very important part which leads to the adoption. Let's talk a bit about what kind of compatibility do we mean when we say Postgres compatibility? Okay, so in terms of the compatibility, there are different layers or different levels of compatibility. One is that, let's say, the, you are compatible, you just allow people to write Postgres SQL. Yeah. Right. You only, so basically you just use exactly the same SQL dialect as Postgres. Yeah. Right. That's a basic, that's probably, let's call it level one. Then level two, if you are well compatible with Postgres, which means that okay, you actually share exactly the same communication pattern or probably communication protocol with, with Postgres. In this way, it means that okay, I can talk to anyone that can talk to Postgres. Let's say, okay, now we both speak English, right? But yeah, some databases may speak, uh, some other guys may speak Japanese or some other guys may sp speak Chinese, right? And yeah. some other guys may speak Spanish, right? They speak different languages, but we speak this, right now we are speaking the same language so that we can communicate. Basically in Postgres world, it's the same thing. Postgres yeah. speaks Postgres language and we also speak Postgres language. So we can actually communicate with anyone, any system that can communicate with Postgres. So that's level two. And level three is more, more advanced. It's basically, it's okay, Postgres fully compatible, which means that okay, you can be compatible with, let's say, Postgres plugin, right? Postgres is about all kinds of plugin, right? And in some extreme cases where people will ask for, let's say, we, let's say we want to have, the, let's say, for Postgres full compatibility, and we also uh, we want to have the, Exactly the same experience like meta using a Postgres, like we have the configuration list, right? Parameters, right? I just want to set the parameters in the same way as setting parameters. So Postgres, that's probably level three, which is means that's for full compatibility. 
for running wave, we are in level two, which means that we are not like, okay, same, exactly the same. We, we, yeah, we, it's not okay operating the same in the same way, exactly the same way as operating a Postgres, but we can speak in Postgres language so that okay. I can talk to everyone that can talk to Postgres. So regarding uh, Postgres and MySQL, I don't really want, I, I think well, this definitely is yeah, a pretty a debatable question, right? So people, some people just love MySQL and some people just love Postgres. Oh, but I can't, to be frank, okay, I'm a Postgres guy. Why? I started working on Postgres around probably 2015 or 16. And I, uh, the first system I built in my PhD, uh, actually not my, uh, the first database system I built in my PhD was called a Peloton, which is a progress in Kashmir University. I started, I did my PhD. Uh, I spent one year with Andy Pablo, the PhD, the Kashmir professor working on database systems. And for that database, we are Postgres compatible. And after that, every single database I built was Postgres compatible. For example, Redshift. Redshift is also Postgres compatible. So I actually have the impression that I, I have the background about, okay, dealing with Postgres. So I love Postgres ecosystem. And I have that, okay, and many other guys also love Postgres. So yeah. I choose to be compatible with Postgres. Okay. Yeah, that's a fair, I would say. What's in the uh, future though? So for example, as we talk about storage layer being used, AWS S3 being used as a storage layer, do you also want to support more storage layers? For example, if people don't want to be on AWS, for example, they want to be on GCP. So is there future plans to support multiple cloud offerings or not tied to one cloud? Or how does that work in your view? Well, when people say that okay, S3 is a primary storage, at least for me, well, I just mean that the okay, object store is a primary storage. So I don't really, yeah. So for writing with it, we actually have writing with cloud operated in all of these three cloud providers, GCP, AWS, and Microsoft Azure. And so it doesn't really mean that okay, we are we're bound to S3. We only support S3. We actually support all these platforms. We actually also support, if you want to do on-prem deployment, because we're open source, right? So if you want to do on-prem deployment, we also support MinIO, which is another popular operator store, right? So yeah, we do not really just bound to S3. That's great. So we just need uh, like an object store and no a computer. Store, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And but compute we can battle uh, S3. Yeah. Speak uh, the, yeah, the, the protocol. Yes. S3 protocol. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Sounds great. So there is a lot of companies that are moving from batch to streaming and they are trying to adopt streaming technologies and there are so many of them. And then streaming databases are also becoming more and more popular. First of all, let's talk about the challenges that people face typically from moving from a batch paradigm to streaming paradigm. And then how is that changing when people adopt like a streaming database? I think for the People, a lot of people talk about well, batch to streaming, but to be honest, I still believe that okay, the streaming market is early compared to batch. I don't know well, how many companies are doing streaming, but for one, we talk to people and ask if they only use batch. When I talk to them, they just tell me that okay, probably we don't really have a real-time use case. Right? Or probably some people will say that okay, we have the use case, but we think that we don't really have the bandwidth to investigate some streaming just streaming solution because where well, they think that's where streaming processing is complicated. And the third time is okay, they were saying that okay, we really want to adopt stream processing, but I think well, stream processing is complicated and expensive. That's what they care about. So that's our cost. Let's talk about the first thing, use case. I think if you don't really have the use case, then I probably can't do nothing. But I have to, the only thing I can do is, I will tell you that okay, if you can make, make real time decisions, then it will help you greatly, right? So for example, you probably, let's say that so if I want to run a factory, I probably don't really want to, okay, check my status, the factory status every single day. I really want to check the status every, let's say, every minute, right? Because I want to make sure that everything is working correctly. That's my pitch. Well, if you, yeah. how do you that? No, we are doing something like financial reporting. I just want to report my data every single month. Okay. That's great. You probably just need your, need a red shirt. Right? That's it. 
Okay, so for, for type two, I think well, that's most of people will say that, okay, when we talk to people, most of people will tell us that, okay, streaming is so complicated and we have the impression that, okay, it has so something called, let's say, the playing call probably, that's why they are not aware of the market. So yeah, they will tell us that, okay, we know that okay, there are something called, okay, Spark streaming or probably something called playing cause probably something called Apache Beam, but we just don't really have the knowledge. We just don't really have the bandwidth to learn these kind of new things. That's number two. That's a second type of people we do is. So basically for this type of people, we, just, we were just argue that hey, luck, you can just use streaming database. The thing here that we do, right? What we build in writing wave is not, it's a streaming database and all pitch to the customers. Most of the time, it's not about, okay, you need to, you, you need to replace your flame quiz writing wave. Well, you, you need to replace your stream processing, stream processing engine with writing wave. Our pitch is more like, okay, you can enter the streaming world in just in database way or using just a Postgres like inference. That's a big thing for the customers. Right. Because what they just want to have an answer to solve their solution, uh, to, to, to the, you, they just want you to give you, them a solution to solve their problem. Right? They don't really want to learn a lot of fancy things. They don't really work. Yeah. So that's the number two type, the second type. And for the third type about the cost, I do agree that if, a, if you are a heavy user of stream processing, for sure, stream processing can, can be expensive because it's continuous curve processing, but the thing here that they can tell to if you really want to have real time data, if you want to really want to have real time insights, using stream processing system can be cheaper than using a fast processing system plus orchestration tools. In Redshift, we see a lot of guys, a lot of users using Redshift plus an orchestration tool like Airflow, right? And they just run the curse exact same query every single minute. That's how things work. Then essentially you will find that this kind of pattern could be very costly. Why? Because every single time you trigger the query, let's say every single minute you just trigger the exact same query, you actually do the computation from scratch. You yeah. just do the full computation, do the full table scan, and then run the full table query for a full query. That's how you, how you do, right? But in a stream processing system, what it does is that where it does incremental query processing. Basically, you do not need to process your data from scratch. You do not need to run exactly the same query from scratch. You just need to process the newly created data, the, the new data, the yeah. new the data. That's it. I mean, that you probably don't need to process, to do a full table scan. You just need to process, let's say, the newly ingested 1% of the data. That's it. It's much cheaper than doing Snowflake or Redshift plus orchestration too, if you really want to have real time result. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's a great way to look at it. Of course, if someone does not have any real uh, time use case, of course, if they want to do reporting, let's say every month, as you mentioned, totally streaming is not for them. But for anyone who want to support real time use case, streaming is the way to go because it can be cheaper, as you mentioned. And using a streaming database uh, takes away a lot of complexity and abstracts away the lot of complexity that you may have to have in your architecture if you have to support streaming pipelines on your own. So that makes sense. Unfortunately, in the interest of time, we have to yep. end this amazing session. But I, th I think we have covered a good amount of breadth at a high level and also depth when it comes to how Rising Wave works. It was lovely to chat with you to understand all the optimizations, all the things related to the architecture, and also from the world of streaming, how companies and people are thinking about it. So thanks a lot for joining us today. I'm going to add the link to the blog in the description so people can take a look. But yeah, thanks a lot for joining us today. And I, I'm, I'm sure our viewers are going to learn from this session. And on the idea of using S3 or an object store as your primary storage, we should definitely collaborate more on, on that in future. Yeah, definitely. I view as where everyone knows that K recently really, AWS just announced uh, the so-called low latency S3, right? But that's definitely yeah. a huge change to market. And I believe that's the reason we can definitely benefit from that. 
And let's see. Yeah, we can definitely discuss more on that topic. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.